Hi, uh, welcome to the New Voting Project. My name is Kanal, um, and today we're here with Wisdom Cole, um, the Interim National Director of the NAACP's Youth and College Division, serving more than 700 youth councils, high school chapters, and college chapters actively fighting for civil rights and the right to vote. Um, you've been featured in NPR, Vice, NBC, um, and the Brookings Institute, The Economist, as an advocate for Black vote Black youth voter turnout um, and issue-based campaigning. And in 2020, you were named one of Complex's, uh, Complex Life's 32 activists who are changing the world. Um, and you're also a former UCSC graduate uh, here in the Bay Area. So thank you for coming out. Um, we do appreciate your time. Uh, I can understand you're very busy. It's great to be here. No, I appreciate it so much. And uh, thank you for you know, shout out my resume, you know, we've done a lot of stuff here at the NAACP, but just even in my organizing experience um, and really attribute like, you know, my growth as an organizer to my time in the Bay Area. Yeah, well, well, thank you so much. Uh, so yeah, let's jump into these questions. Um, just for our first question uh, for the viewers, talk a little bit about your background and, and touch on how your, your college experience prepared you for the responsibilities you assume today. Yeah, so uh, I went to UC Santa Cruz, like you said. I was originally a biochemistry major, and then I graduated with a degree in chemistry. Um, but along the lines of my college journey, um, I really got connected with you know youth organizing and really being in different Black organizing spaces. Um, I really went to college thinking I was going to be in the books, studying 24-7. You know, my original plan was to go to medical school and become a doctor. And you know, quickly within my experience um, in college, my perspective changed. I really talk about my college experience as being able to give me the words to describe my experience as a black man in America. Um, you know, coming from a Nigerian household, um, just even growing up, I had to navigate my experience as being an immigrant, but also being black in America or black, you know, globally. And so when I went to college, I began to meet all types of students and organizers from across the state of California who had very similar experiences to me, um, grew up in very similar households, struggled with the, the same things that I struggled with, and really, you know, posing the question, uh, what are you going to do about it? Um, I remember taking this class about uh, Black and African American and Latino students in STEM, and hearing all these problems and disparities um, and lack of access for our people, and just finding myself, you know, at a crossroads where I'm like, what's happening? Like, this is happening every single day and anybody, no one's doing anything about it. And I really had to turn to myself and be like, well, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to get engaged? How are you going to make sure that this stops and that we create a better future uh, for those who are coming after you? And so from then on out, I really began to tap into a lot of campus organizing spaces. Um, I joined the BSU. Um, I joined an organization called the African Black Coalition, which is the largest uh, Black collegiate um, organization in the state of California. Um, and that's really where my organizing journey took off. Um, I really got to be in this place and space and time where people were looking for leaders, people were looking for people who are willing to organize and willing to learn. And so for me in that moment in time, I was trying to go to everything and anything I could to learn more and more. And what I really love about my organizing journey is that I learned from my peers, right? I went to uh, UC Berkeley and saw how they organized to have an Afro house. And I was like, how do we do this at Santa Cruz? Um, I went to UC Riverside for a conference uh, for the Student of Color Conference, right? And experienced, you know, different understandings of what does it mean to understand our intersectional identities. And so I really began to have, you know, between my sophomore and junior year, really this organizing awakening where I really began to see myself as a leader in a movement, somebody who could cause change. And I think really um, where it took off was the summer between um, my sophomore year and my junior year. This was uh, summer 2013. This is right when the Trayvon Martin verdict came out. And that was just something that changed my life forever, right? Where it was the summertime, there was not a lot of students on campus, people were there. Um, but there was no response from the university around uh, this injustice that just happened nationally. And, you know, all of us saw ourselves in Trayvon, all of us saw ourselves in those experiences. And so we felt the need to do something. So we organized the march. We stopped, shut down the city, stopped business as usual so that we needed to recognize what was going on in this space and place and time and that the city the school had an obligation to respond and do something to ensure that Black students felt safe on campus. And so 
um, that's really kind of where my, my organizing journey took off and really informed the experiences I had in terms of building membership-based organizations, um, expanding youth leadership, and giving young people the tools and tactics they need to organize for power. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a pretty, pretty wonderful story you have there. I like to say the same reason I got started was because I noticed a problem, right? In school, you know, I'm sure in many, you know, intellectual um, environments, you, you talk about your problems with your professors, you know, you talk about them, you discuss them, you, you know, you join clubs. I was in speech and debate a lot, you know, in high school. I'm still in high school. I, I feel like I'm in college. <laughs> but, you know, you talk about these, you discuss them, you conversate. It's a day-to-day -day operation. And then you ask yourself, well, if these problems do currently exist, why am I not trying to actively promote the solutions we're discussing? You know, it's not just we're talking, we're talking about things to do, things to change. Um, and so do I do respect that from organizer to organizer, you, you know, you, you took up that mantle. Um, and, and I think it's it served you well. Um, so thank you for that. Um, my second question, I guess you've, you've partly answered is why why take up to to enter politics, you currently work at the NAACP, you know, why why go that activism community organizing route, um, when there's when there's multiple ways to, to influence change at a policy level. Yeah, so I was really at a place in my time in my life where I recognized that different times call for different strategies, right? Um, I never was a political operative, a political organizer. I was really about, you know, community based. What does it mean for us to give ourselves the tools and tactics necessary to um, liberate ourselves, right? Because I really believe that when you are dependent on other people, dependent on other folks or other groups or other communities, um, narrative change objective change, things of that nature. And the only way that you can really continue to ensure that the people who are most marginalized in a community um, get what they need is by giving them the power. Um, and so right after my college experience, I actually became a high school teacher. I taught high school chemistry, high school math, and a little bit of African-American studies, uh, because for me, that was really the opportunity to awaken minds. Like, you know, how do we uh, use education as a tool for organizing? Um, oftentimes people would come into my classroom and they would think that it was a history class or it was a social science class, but it was a chemistry class, and math class, because chemistry, math, academic studies, history, it's all connected to each other. Um, and then I remember, you know, math. math is useless on this channel. Yeah, math is math is everything. We can go in. We can talk <laughs> about it. We can talk about it. But um, yeah, so, you know, I was it was a place in my life where I remember the day uh, that Donald Trump was elected. And I remember going into the classroom and teaching my students and seeing the fear in many of my students' eyes, seeing the uncertainty, not knowing where the future was going, not knowing what this really meant for them and their families. You know, many of my students were undocumented. Um, and so, you know, for them that period of time, they didn't know what the answer or the solution was. And something that I constantly practiced in my class was mindfulness and centering. And something that I made sure we said that morning that he was elected um, was this quote or the statement of power by Asada Shakur that says, it is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and protect one another. We have nothing to lose but our chains. And when I really began to think about what that meant for me in that period of time was that it was time for me to kind of get in the game and get into action and recognize that building black political power is an opportunity or a tool or tactic to allow us to move towards uh, whatever sense of liberation that we're fighting for, right? That there are a lot of uh, political legislation that is in our way or prohibits us from doing the things that we need to do or making sure that the communities get the uh, resources necessary to support themselves uh, to just have a just and free life. And so for me in that period of time, I was very open to being able to enter into the political system and understand um, what it really means to build political power um, from a local level, from a state level, and, and now in the world on that, from national level, like recognizing that we can have local victories and local wins uh, to build national narratives, right? Something I've been exploring lately is like the history of the Black Panthers and looking at their, their origin. I'm not gonna joke. I was literally about to say, you should, you, this is so reminiscent because I'm, you know, I'm, I study American history. This is so reminiscent of the Black Panther Party. I was literally about to tell you the Black Panther Party is literally what you're telling. I'm so blown away. No, you continue. You continue. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I've been, I've been searching and researching into that more um, because one, just like the Bay Area you sound has like such it. an influence. You sound like you're, you're researching it because I was like, oh my God, he's talking about like the Black Panther Party's initiatives. But do continue. Yeah. Exactly. It's 
it's it's you know exactly in Oakland, and then you look at the original um, history in the South, right, in Loudoun County, right. um, and them actually being a political party, right, getting people out to vote, making sure that folks um, were were voting for this, you know, local independent party, um, and recognizing that this is how we build Black political party, uh, our, our, our political power, um, and you know, within the role I have now. And even just within my life, right, I've had a great opportunity to speak to so many elders within the movement, right? I've been able to sit down with Elaine Brown, um, you know, who was one of the, the leaders for the Black Panther Party. Um, I, I got to speak with uh, Cortland Cox, you know, who was one of the leaders for uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, I got to speak with Bob Moses and be mentored by, by him, you know, rest in peace. He just passed away recently. Uh, but he, his journey is very reflective of my journey as a math teacher and organizer um, and using the this, these are tools for liberation. Yeah, the algebra project. I, I, taught, I taught the algebra project. Yeah, no, in fact, I was supposed to have Bob on the show um, weeks. Of course, he passed away, but I was going to have Bob on the show this month. Uh, because he is actually a mentor to Danny Glover, who who currently serves as my mentor um, in in the same political landscape. But uh, yeah, rest in peace, rest in power to Bob Moses. Rest in power, rest in power. But yeah, seeing how like just understanding the history, the history of building a black political power, how that has grown from the local level. That's really kind of what got me into the space and place I am today. And thinking about in this period in time, we have the opportunity to change a lot of systems of oppression um, for our people. And so how do we make sure that folks have the right tools to be able to speak and advocate with their elected officials? How do we make sure that folks um, are able to um, build power on the local level and ensure that they are able to have victory and determine um, what their community looks like and the resources that are available? Yeah, no, I, I, I co-sign that all the way. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing else. That's, that's, that's amazing. Um, and I guess, kind of as an extension of that, what are, what are some of the values? What are some of the policy objectives that I guess you're taking in your role right now at the NAACP? You're leading the youth and college division. You're obviously focused on civic engagement in the youth. What are you trying to advocate to them that, and that you hope to accomplish with them? Yeah, so civic engagement is, is, is tricky. It's really interesting, right? Like as young people, we've seen elections be been stolen, We've seen corrupt politicians. We've seen, um, you know, the rise and fall of what some people may call a dictatorship, right? You know, we've seen a lot of harm come from political spaces. And so a lot of times folks ask me, you know, why are young people not involved in politics? Why are young people not engaged in voting? Um, and I'm like, have you seen the news lately? Have you seen what's happened? <laughs> right. You know, like, why, why would they? Right. But we have to recognize that like young people and all people are not single issue voters, right? That our lives are intersectional, that there are multiple issues that guide our lives and that we have to make sure that as we are advocating for civic engagement, for people to, to use and understand the power of their vote, right? Like I, until being in this role and being in this space and working at the NAACP, that I really understand the power of our vote, the power of civic engagement and how much money and time and energy people put into ensuring that the vote goes their way, right? There are people lobbying and political operatives who are doing so much work on a day-to-day -day basis, not even, even subconsciously, like from the ads we watch uh, to the cartoons that you know young people see, like there's so much work that goes into getting people to believe one direction. Um, I think it's absolutely necessary for us to take back that power and recognize that there's so many issues that intertwine with it. So what I focus on is how do I make sure that folks understand how they can push for the cancellation of student debt, right? That's a priority campaign that we're working on. How do we ensure that there's police accountability and transparency? How do we ensure, ensure that the corporations that we buy from each and every day are accountable to uh, the people that they serve and the people that they are collecting money from, right? Uh, throughout 2020, there was a rise in corporations who were standing for Black Lives Matter and supporting Black organizations, but giving pennies on the dollar for what they actually could actually do to support, but not changing their infrastructure or who's in leadership or the decision-making power uh, between them and the people who work in the corporations. And so recognizing that all these issues affect our lives, how do we make sure that as we are telling people to go vote and go vote and getting doing voter registration and uh, GOTV and all these different things that we do to ensure that people turn out on election day, that we also highlight the issues that drive our lives because that is going to make sure people um, have a voice, that people see it different. Like I tell you, right, you know, if people, if Biden cancels student debt tomorrow, everybody's going to have to vote. Right. They said, oh, we, I, I got it. Look, look, I can do that. I'm engaged. It's going to wake some people up. And so we really need 
for you know some real policy change, um, not just people talking about it, not people making empty promises, not people flipping like reciprocals. We need real policy change, real policy action to change people's lives. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Biden should cancel student debt, but that, that should be an episode I do with Biden himself. Uh, <laughs> shout out to anybody from the White House who's watching. Um, and you'd mentioned the year 2020, right? Um, I always like to, to put this as a starting point of, of where we are right now. 2020 um, election, uh, uh, once in a century pandemic. I mean, a crazy year, Black Lives Matter. I mean, it was so, I, I, you know, in, in all my lives, uh, you know, in all my 17 years, I've never seen a year like that. Then again, I'm only 17. Um, <laughs> give me your thoughts on the 2020 election um, and, and what solutions or what lessons you've learned since then um, in, in your role? 2020 was wild. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I remember I remember starting 2020 off um, and I wrote this amazing civic engagement plan and how we were to turn out and how we were going to get people engaged and that we were going to do um, all these things with HBCUs and we were going to do these tours and we were going to do these campus plus programs and engage the community and make sure that like our students are engaging on campus, but also engaging with the community around them. And I was so excited. And then the pandemic hit and I was just like, well, none of this is going to work anymore. Right. Like, what does it mean for us to engage? Like, we can't even go outside. We can't even leave the house. We're figuring out what this, you know, what's happening in not just our country, but happening around the world. Right. And it was definitely disheartening. It definitely was difficult. I definitely had to take a couple of weeks just to figure out, like, what is life? Um, <laughs> and at a certain point within the pandemic, this was maybe around the end of April, beginning of May, because it was always this idea that, oh, like we're, we're going back, we're gonna go back to normal. We're gonna go back to normal. Oh, things are gonna be back to normal in a month, in two months, in three months. Oh, by the end of summer, we'll be fine, it'll be good. And I really had to, to sit and think and, and say to myself, we're never going back to the world that we lived in before. Right. We're only entering into a new world. Like the world right now is clay. Everybody is trying to figure out how to define how we move forward. So who's to say that we can't define how we move forward? Who's to say that we can define how education proceeds, how we go back to school, how our online learning um, is executed, um, how we do uh, advocacy work, how we define success in civic engagement, how we define success in campaign work, right? Like this is an opportunity to redefine what this work looks like. And that's really what empowered me and really kind of got me back in terms of the work that I needed to do as an organizer. So, you know, within 2020, we really had to, change our tactics right you know normally we'd be uh door knocking and um tabling and doing class reps and you know getting people to, to register to vote in this personal um way that's really meaningful to us individually but we had to quickly change our tactics to really engage in these virtual spaces right we had to do uh digital and virtual canvassing we had to hold multiple virtual events we had to use uh, SMS and email and all these digital tools to ensure that we were getting our message out, but also making sure that our message um, was specific to the communities that we wanted to target. And so meaning that we were speaking to people holistically and not just for this vote, right? Where oftentimes, you know, people parachute in and out of our communities a couple months before the elections and ask us to vote and ask the vote. And then after the election, we never see them again. And we can't do that, that harms communities. Like we have to make sure there's sustainable interests, sustainable people and continual uh, growth within those communities. So when I am organizing um, around electoral politics, I'm also thinking about the sustainability of our chapters and our state conferences and our young people who are organizing there and ensuring that after any civic engagement campaign that they have skills, tactics and tools and opportunities that they continue to use even after the election is over. So. Uh, the work I do really in 2020 was reimagining and re-envisioning what success looks like in this work and really thinking about the virtual tools that we used. Now kind of exiting 2020 and kind of thinking about, you know, we're almost in this hybrid model where we have to do both, right? We got to engage people virtually, like that's not going away, but there has to be some semblance of boots on the ground, right? Young people haven't been doing some of these classic organizing tools that we've been doing year in and year out um, before that. And some of these tools are expired. Some things we need to update, you know, things need system update. Like, you know, clearly like Texas needs to have some online voter registration because you have all these people there and we're in the pandemic. Like there needs to be access for that. 
And the reason why they don't have it, it's purposeful. Um, but we can go into that's a that's yeah. a separate tangent. That's a separate um, question. There's <laughs> a there's a separate question, a separate tangent. But like recognizing that there has to be a both and structure, right? That we have to do this virtual space, we have to engage in these digital spaces, but we have to give young people the tools and tactics uh, to engage with boots on the ground. And so what I'm constantly working on is how we how do we marry the two? How do we give people uh, the, the right training and leadership development to ensure that we are able to continue engagement into 2022? Like we had such high turnout in 2020 in the middle of a global pandemic. We saw young people uh, coming out as poll workers uh, for the very first time in a very massive way because we had to step up and do that, right? You know, usually our elders are the ones who were there holding it down, making it happen, but because they were more at risk, we had to step up and we had to be in those positions and work those polls and make sure that we were getting out the vote. And so moving forward, we have to think about this hybrid model and recognize that for 2022, the work doesn't start three months before the election or even in 2022, the work has already started. And we have to make sure that we are keeping um, the new elected officials accountable. We have to make sure that we are pursuing local wins and building national narratives to inform the decisions that are to be made in 2022. Yeah. No, no, definitely, I agree. As a poll worker, um, as a political activist, I could tell you myself, redistricting and and uh, we have to deal with the recall election here in California. So that's what I'm doing in September. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, it, the 2022 primaries is something we're keeping a close eye on, um, definitely. Um, now, my next question is is very basic. It's it's a it's a multi part question. So so prepare yourself. First, starting off with how important is voting? I think, I think about voting as a tool, right? When you say uh, how important is voting, you, I think, you know, oftentimes we think like, oh, it's the most important thing, right? You know, we want to make sure that our, our democracy is preserved. But voting is a tool that we use to achieve a goal, right? What's more important than voting is our permanent interests right, is making sure that there are interests that are aligned and that we're using voting to achieve those interests. And so um, as important as any tool is to accomplish its tool, it's a task, that's how important it is, right? We can't live and die uh, just by the vote. Um, just like I was saying earlier, the vote has to be incorporated into the issue that drives our lives. Right, and it's, it's, it's the way I describe voting, it's, it's the first step. Right, it's not it's not the end all be all, right? It's not the silver bullet. Um, and you know, when when I try to convince somebody to vote, like during the twenty twenty election, anybody who walked into my house, their first question was, you know, I, I had to screen them, like, did you vote? Did you get your ballot in the mail yet? Have you sent it back? Because I can give you three polling locations near me where you can go drop it off, right? Voting is the first thing you should be doing, right? That it should be like inherent, right? It's it's your imperative as a citizen. Um, if it was me, I'd make it a law, right? Uh, but I, it's not me. Um, on that note, should young people like me, you know, I'm six, 16, 17 year olds, I'm 17, I'll be voting in my first election next year, you know, so I'm excited for that. I'm pre-registered, you know, I'm, I'm with the game, you know, I'm, I'm hip, you know, should, should we- You're ready, you're ready, you're ready to go. Um, should 16, 17 year olds be allowed to, to cast their opinion, to, 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 fulfill their prerogative, um, at least at a local level. We look at school boards who define their school policies. We look at municipalities that dedicate the, the, the school budgets and the police budgets, you know, topics that young people are not interested in. Should we have the right to vote? I totally agree that 16 year olds should have the right to vote. Um, I love what they did in Berkeley, right? And passing that, that 16 year olds could vote within the local elections. I think it's absolutely necessary, right? especially thinking about or as a former educator, right? And also, you know, a continual educator because that's what I, I love to do and, and be in those spaces and places, but recognizing how important civic engagement and understanding the world around us, right? It's not your classic civics class talking about the same, you know, the branches of the government, which is also very important to understand, but recognizing that there are issues that drive our lives and it's all connected to the vote, all connected, like we can vote on these things. And I think that making sure that there is appropriate civics education curriculum um, and making sure that, you know, folks are getting involved. Like I, I could continue to advocate to all my friends who are teachers still that like, if you're teaching high school kids, like even, even elementary school, middle school, all of them on election day, take them to the polls, show them how it works, 
show them how it happens. Have mock elections in your school where folks can see that process and so that it is incorporated into their lives forever. You know, we know when young people vote, um, when they become 18, that they're lifelong voters, right? When you vote in your very first election, you're more likely to continue to vote. When you see voting happening in your family, you're most likely to continue voting, right? I love that you're everybody, you're checking everybody, hey, have you voted, have you voted? That's a conversation thing that people need to be having. People need to be talking about like, hey, what do you think about this ballot initiative over the dinner room table or what's happening? And I know not everybody has those, those lives that are structured to do that. Um, and so I think, you know, there's ways that we can incorporate it within the education system, but I absolutely do believe that 16 year olds deserve the right to vote. Um, I think there's a lot of great opportunity for them um, to engage in electoral politics. And, you know, the younger that we're able to get people in, involved, you know, the longer that they are going to stay involved and stay engaged um, even after the first time that they vote. Like, I always love the feeling of like, you know, vote like it's your first time. Like, you know, the very first time that you vote, the very first time that I got to vote for Obama, I was like, wow, like I got to, I got to vote for a Black president right, that changed my life forever, that changed my perspective, right, I was an Obama kid, right, I was wearing the shirts, you know, changes come, come to America, all that kind of stuff, I was, I was out there, but that was because there was a culture or um, a support for me to have that mindset and that mind frame, so the fact that I'm in the position I am today, it's not by accident, it's not by mistake, right, there were people in my lives who mentored me to be in this place, but it started at a young age. Yeah, no, I, uh, I remember, I think it was the 2016 elections uh, and, and the primaries. My parents took me to the polls. I got to know that, you know, they have those little curtains, you know, and I'm peeking around. I'm like, who are they voting for? You know, I'm like, maybe you should put this one instead of that one. But yeah, no, the voting should be taught from a young age. Um, and, and, and definitely I, I do, I do just want to say some folks like, you know, I, I like to say I'm special, you know, cause I'm so engaged, but some 16, 17 year olds aren't. So, so the often counter argument is that, you know, should we really give them that responsibility? But I say, you know, what I say to that is until you give them the opportunity, they'll never know how to try. Right. Facts. Facts. They'll, ne they'll never understand that we're going to give it to you, you know, where we're going to hand it to you. If you take it up now, you're more likely to become successful at the end of, at the end of the road. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And inform like, if we want to see a society where people are engaged, where people are able to create the world around them, then we have to be able to give them the ability to do so, right? That's what's going on um, in this fight for voting rights right now, right? Where, and that, that's why we have to remember, like, this is not by accident, right? The reason, right, to come back to your question about some of the reflections from 2020, you know, we're seeing all of these legislation, I think it was over 300, over 400 different voter suppression bills come out um, all across America. And that was a direct response to what happened in 2020, right? When people had the opportunity, even in the midst of a global pandemic to turn out, they recognized that they needed to still do what they needed to do. Um, people were dying all across the country. People didn't know what was going on. We're still trying to figure it out day by day. Every week felt like there was some new issue happening, something you know occurring, but folks still felt the need to continue to be a part of the movement. And so I think that the more we give folks access to it, the more we're able to put structures into place, the more we're able to define particularly what our local community, right? This is what our local community looks like. Um, don't, don't even think national yet, but like the local work informs the national narratives. Right, yeah, no, definitely. Now, now this is a question I know you've been waiting to answer, um, which is Georgia, Texas, you know, we see these voting rights restrictions happen in these states. Like you said, conservative reaction to the 2020 results. You know, and I and I just like to point out the 2020 results really helped both parties, because if you look at the turnout, you know, it's like almost 150 million. It's basically Joe Biden won by I don't know a couple million votes. I don't know the exact numbers, but it was a pretty split um, split amount of, of voters on both sides of the aisle. Just just to make that clear, when I when I saw the numbers those days, um, what are your thoughts on on what on what is happening in Texas and Georgia? We have voting rights restrictions. We have poll workers, you know, unable to give out water bottles, you know, what, what, what kind of, I hate to say, what kind of bullshit is this like? From it's, your it's ridiculous. Yeah. It's, it's ridiculous. It is purposeful. It is distractions, right? It is something to set us off course, right? You know, I think what happened in 2020 was not a fluke. It wasn't by accident. Um, you know, uh, a friend of mine in Georgia, 
you know, he always says that uh, organizers won the election, right? It wasn't um, because of one political party or the other. It was organizers who had set up infrastructure within their states and consistently working, right? You know, uh, folks like Stacey Abrams um, and say Ufat, you know, these people, these black women in, in Georgia who were consistently um, working for years and years and years, right? Um, and I, I remember, you know, seeing um, Stacey Abrams, you know, in her run for, for governor. And, you know, even after that, her consistent work to ensure that folks were getting registered, that folks had IDs, um, that, you know, there were systems or, or, or midi mitigations in place to help support uh, people who didn't have access. Um, it was consistent work necessary to do that. And so I think that these voter suppression laws are a direct result of that. I think that they are a distraction. I think that, you know, folks are, are constantly working to overcome them. I know there are many lawsuits and um, work being done to make sure that uh, these voter suppression bills don't pass and that folks aren't able to uh, not vote. But I think that it's also time from a national level, right, thinking at Congress to really pass some legislation um, that protects our vote and ensures that we have uh, the opportunity to fulfill uh, what some may call our civic duty and that folks have access and opportunity because the more and more restrictive voting laws, the less and less people are going to see turnout and the less and less control that we have over our day-to-day -day lives. And I think that this is like a place where like we are in this, we're in this uh, turning point moment, right? Where, and I think, yeah, I always think about like, you know, from history, like everybody thinks that we've been in these periods in time where like, oh, like things, there's like, there's, everything is very uh, polarized, right? Like the idea of um, maskers versus anti-maskers, vaxxers versus anti-vaxxers, right? And it feels very polarizing. And we've been through these experiences multiple times. And I constantly think like, what side of history do we wanna be on? Right when our children's children read back at this period in time, right? This period in time is going to be documented in the history books, right? And so, if we have the opportunity there'll to change what America, there'll be a whole chapter just on the pandemic. Whole, yeah, a, a whole chapter on the pandemic. There's going to be essay questions, and people are going to be, you know, writing stuff. Um, their AP U.S. history oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, tests about the pandemic and using inciting sources, and this person said this, and this person said that. Um, to justify their reason. And so to, do we want to be a part of this generation that caused change, that allowed us to ensure that we have victory? And so I think that's where we're at right now. I think there's a lot of people who are fighting to ensure that things pass, recognizing that this fight for voting rights um, is a multicultural struggle, that it, it requires coalitions. It requires all of us and not just some of us. It requires that, you know, some of us don't necessarily have the same points um, or same um, agendas or same people that we uh, serve, but that we need each other to make this happen, right? When um, John Lewis led uh, folks across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, you know, that was, a, that was a moment in time and that had to happen to really push Congress to say like, we need to, we need to ensure that everybody has access to the vote, right? There's no more opportunities to suppress and we should stop this. But just because we don't have the paper bag test, doesn't mean that suppression doesn't exist every day. So, and even in, even in the state of California, right? Even in the state of California, we think we're sometimes the most progressive. There's still a lot of suppression that still happens within the state as well. Yeah, you'd be surprised how much rampant corruption is in the state of California, all the way up to the attorney general's office, the governor. You know, we look at these states like blue red, but you dig deeper, you talk to the organizers on the ground, you'll find out the real story. Um, and that's something I can personally attest to. Um, but just in closing, um, this has been a great time uh, talking with you. Um, what is your advice to the next generation, the, the graduating class of voters, the folks who want to get involved or want to find an avenue uh, to, to exercise their, their, their rights and, and their, their um, priorities, what they believe in? What would you recommend we do um, at, this, at this precipice? I'd say one find a local organization that you can get involved in, right? It's very important to build community power. It's very important to meet with people who um, are like-minded and to continue to build strategies uh, to change the world around you immediately, right? Um, there's so much stuff happening outside um, and that's very important. And I love the aspect of organizers connecting with other organizers from different states so they can understand like what people are doing and strategies necessary, but start locally, right? Start locally find an organization, um, continue to be bold, 
continue to be dangerous, continue to be aggressive, right? I think oftentimes a lot of the ideology that comes from um, millennials and even more Gen Z, right? I love seeing your generation grow, grow up and what they're doing in the different innovative ways in which you all are discussing politics, right? Like I remember like my political education originally quote unquote came from Facebook and these conversations happening and people posting articles. Now political education is on TikTok, right? Like, you know, things uh, evolve and they grow and that's okay, right? We need system updates. We need um, these opportunities. And oftentimes when you are trying to update um, systems that have constantly been in play for, you know, years or longer than you've been alive, it feels daunting. It feels difficult. It feels nearly impossible. But every time there has been any uh, change that's happened in America or in the world, you know, it's, it's, it's had to go, um, you know, you have to kind of just continue pushing, right? And people will say that you're crazy. People will say that you don't know what you're doing. People will say that you're too young, um, but recognizing that this is our world too, and that we have to build this future, uh, not just for ourselves, but for those who are coming behind us too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, that's, that's, <laughs> I got nothing, you know, that, that pretty much sums it up. Uh, and, and just on yourself, how can viewers stay updated on you um, and, and your work at the NAACP if you want to plug your socials? I'll link them in the description. Um, but if you want to shout out. Definitely. Yourself. Most definitely. So um, for the NAACP Youth and College Division, definitely follow us on Instagram at NAACPYC underscore. Uh, we're also on Twitter and TikTok. Um, you can go to our website, www.naacp.org, to become a member because membership is power. You can get connected with local units, chapters. Um, we have you know, chapters all across America on a majority of campuses, majority of HBCUs. Um, and we want to make sure that you're getting plugged in and engaged um, so you can build with a community that is fighting for the future of freedom. And so um, I'm super glad to be here with you and have this conversation. I, you know, I love this kind of, these kind of conversations because I also feel invigorated and, you know, reminded of, you know, what I believe in and what I stand for and what I'm doing. And so it's been uh, great to share this space and time with you. Yeah, no, say it's likewise. Uh, yeah. I, every time I finish an interview, you know, I always feel the sense of empowerment, you know, because as organizers, we get so burned out over the, the extenuous amount of hours we work in Zoom calls and phone calls and text messages and emails we send every day, y you know, it slowly fades away. And then you'll meet somebody and they'll be like, ah, oh, shit, you know, <laughs> it's, it's time to get back up and, and keep fighting. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate your time, um, your, your, your perspective. I think you bring one that, that's, that's very fresh and it's local to me. You know, I just noticed actually the water bottle that I always drink uh, out of in these interviews, actually UCSC. Uh, Yo. You know I rep, you know. Yeah, go slugs, go slugs. Um, yeah, no, is there, is there anything you'd like to add before we, before we end out? Um, nothing in particular, you know. I think that it is a brave new world out there. We need new ideas, new opportunities, and we need new minds to really help reinvent these structures, right? Um, something I'm constantly advocating for is for folks to get into politics, right? Like I was, you know, kind of afraid to get into politics for so long because I didn't think I had a voice in it. I didn't think I had a space in it. Um, and then just recognizing, you know, the purpose and how it can use to be served for a, a function for freedom and what's going to be necessary, right? For anything to happen, we need, to, we need political power. And I want to be able to be in a space where I can build that political power to allow the folks who are continuing to do liberation work, continuing to do groundwork, continuing to do leadership work, to have the space and time to create the future that we need to create. And so um, for as long as I can do this, I will be here and I will continue fighting forward. Good, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a good fight. And uh, when are you running for office? You know, I'm, you know, people ask me that a lot. I'm not necessarily interested in running for office if I'm being 100%, um, maybe, maybe somewhere in the back of my head. But I love, you know, you know, I hope I see my future, you know, supporting campaigns, being a campaign manager, um, helping. I love finding talented people who have that passion um, for politics and being in those spaces and places and making sure that they're able to achieve their dreams. So, um, you know, I think my future yeah, may be in, in campaign management. That doesn't an answer my question. I said, when are you running for office? Not what alternative career paths are you considering? It, it was it was more of like a date and time, like, you know, the next three years or something. I don't know. I'm just saying, pay attention. I'm all going to say this now. You weren't the first person I'm going to say this in a public interview. I said, just pay attention to 2054, okay? 2054. Pay attention. Uh, 
I'm going to run for president. 2054. I'm going to run for president in 2050. There you go. Okay, I love it. I love it. I'm going to pay attention to 2050 too. <laughs> no, but thank you so much, Wisdom. Um, and, and we'd love to have you back on the show anytime. Um, just let me know. And, and any issue you want to talk about, we're, we're, we're game. Most definitely. Great to be here. Take care, man. Peace.